This is Group A, Josh Jones. Our other group members are Amber James, Morgan Ingram, and Josh Ism. We decided to interview Mark Sonker, the executive director of the Georgia Bulldog Club. Uh, we decided to pick him because we heard he was a great leader. He was a former basketball coach. He's one of the best fundraisers in the nation, as you could tell, because Georgia is one of the high, highest revenue generated school universities. And we really want to get his point of view and how to be, su be successful in his job and his advice to future sport managers. So we interviewed him on September 14th at 3.30, and uh, we tied in a couple chapters related to our book, we, uh, we talked about his ethical behavior, ethical behavior views, motivation for pursuing a, pursuing a career in sports, uh, what kind of ethical culture he set as a coach, his social response on his job, moral reasoning, and his viewpoints on NCAA uh, regulations and sponsorships. So our focus to get his, is to get a sincere ethical point of view in his, in his current and past jobs, and what it takes to be a successful leader, in the competitive sports world, competitive sports world. We tied in some questions that we're going uh, to show in this presentation. Some are, uh, as a coach, what do you think your players expected from you in an ethical culture? For example, do they, do they think you were approachable, fair, consistent, provided confidence, a motivator, provide a personal concern? Another question is, what are your thoughts about NCAA fundraising? currently and in, in just out of all NCAA. Uh, another one is, what do you think your social responsibility is as the director of the Georgia Bulldog Club? Um, another one is, how will you incorporate code of ethics into a sport management setting? Lastly, we asked for his advice to future sport management people in the sports world. Uh, thank you and enjoy our presentation. I fortunately have two older brothers who did go to college. My mother was a big uh, advocate for college. Mm -hmm. um, nobody else in, in the family really was going, and my cousins weren't going, none of that stuff. And she drove it home. So, went to, so but in the meantime, I got good at basketball and yeah. started getting recruited and um, wound up being recruited by really my final schools. There was no Big East back then. So, it was really um, Pittsburgh, Georgia, Fairfield, and Manhattan were really my four finals. Mm -hmm. Finalists. I always wanted to go away from home. Uh, I've had the opportunity to get out of that environment, just to try something different. And uh, Georgia recruited me, offered a scholarship, and came here to play basketball for four years as a letterman. I uh, tried to deny what I truly was burning passion for, and that was the coach. And I yeah. went into journalism, they wanted to be a dumb jock at first, <laughs> into journalism, and I made it in history. I was like, what am I doing? I'm a kid, I don't really want to coach. Yeah. And I didn't want to see myself teaching history all day long. But I wanted to be a college coach. To, if I had to do high school, I didn't want to do it for long. So I graduated uh, from Georgia in five years because those major changes, you know, I got behind in credits. So when I went back over to, to ed school education, got my PE degree, and then um, I started my coaching career, uh, coaching high school basketball at Lovett School in Atlanta, mm -hmm. which was a big culture shock to me because I didn't know <laughs> private school and the only private school was for Catholic high schools, which were, you know, you know, just for working class people more that kind of thing. So but I had a good experience there, built that program up for three years. So it was always pursuing my career the goal to be a college basketball coach and then got the offer to the assistant job at Georgia State spent six years there as an assistant uh, one year actually had to be the interim head coach mm -hmm. and uh, they fired the coach the head coach three games into the season I was 27 I'd be the head coach the rest of the season wow but, yeah, that was a culture shock that was tough <laughs> <laughs> but the, the new coach kept me on which was good I knew him already and when he got hired as head coach I was fortunate because usually you know when a guy you're working for gets fired you're fired too and yeah. Um, but that, the new coach kept me on the staff, so I did four more years with him, and then Georgia called me back, and I came here as an assistant coach for six years under Coach Durham. We got fired, um, <laughs> <laughs> and then Goodness. I went to Pensacola Junior College for two years as a head coach, and my goal was to be a Division One head coach. Yeah. I was going to be a Division One head coach. If I could be head coach at Georgia, that'd be great, but I want to be head coach. Want to be head coach. So um, to keep the dream alive, I went to Pensacola Junior College for two years, uh, again, a big step from being, you know, an SEC as full-time assistant coach, having two top ten recruiting classes, you know, feeling pretty good about yourself. But Coach Dooley and Coach uh, Durham had a big argument. Yeah. We actually came in second place in the SEC and got fired. How about that? So I got offered plenty of assistant jobs at the lower level. 
I said, I already did my time at that level. If I'm not gonna offer a job in the SEC or ACC as an assistant, yeah. then I'm out. So took a chance, came here as, I got offered a job here as a fundraiser for the university. Mm -hmm. um, and did that for three years, learned the lingo, learned the, the, the fundamentals of fundraising. And then Greg McGarrity got the job. I had known him since college. We worked together when I was an assistant coach here. He was assistant AD. No, you know, for a long time. This job opened up as uh, head of all the fundraising for the athletic department. And I applied for it and got it and been here for the last three years. But, um, you know, throughout my career, even as an assistant and then as a head coach, um, I would probably call myself more of a player's coach. Mm -hmm. I, I like, I value the relationship. Like I said before, yeah. that was very important to me that I work with them, get them, make them the best player they could be with, it, be the eighth person on the team or the leading scorer, whichever one it was, and I was working with them to try to get them to be, make them the best that they could be at this, um, and put, fitting it into the team concept. So I always was very approachable, I was always around, I don't golf, I don't drink much, I mean, I wasn't running around trying to get out of there, so usually I was around, you know, they could come by and see me, talk to me, that kind of thing, so I was always, you know, I valued it very much to have that relationship. Uh, with my players, so it was important to me, and I always try to reach out to them in those areas. So it's basically making everybody feel important, exactly. even if they weren't a starter. Exactly. So it's just good, uh, good environment overall. In the try team. to, you know, so it's not you know, always successful because there's um, outside influencers. Might be a parents that think you know I was not treating their son right because they didn't play enough, or you know I don't get mad often, but sometimes I got mad at somebody. You know. There was times that they might come back to their parents or somebody else and, and said, hey, man, I was mistreated by Sonic or you didn't treat me right. Mm -hmm. And then we have to talk it out, figure it out. But those situations happen sometimes. It, you're not going to be perfect at it all the time because it's yeah. just everybody's got different personalities. Everybody's got different goals, expectations. And then those outside influencers are really ones that play with a lot yeah, of players' heads. The parents, parents and, and, and the friends. Um, yeah, parents you got to do certain things. things. Yeah, you, you're, all, you're all American ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, somebody had to be better. Yeah. So, yeah. Competition, <laughs> you have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's just a <laughs> battle of those things, too. You're not, you're not, and again, different phases of my life didn't handle every situation, you know, right, properly maybe, you know, because sometimes you're emotional. You know, I remember one big argument I had with another center after a game here, to this day, if it's like, shake my head over, I think about it, like, why did I handle it like that? I didn't handle it right. But yeah. I was emotionally charged, he was emotionally charged, and we let our emotions get away from ourselves. Kind of like when you get in the core, you just change. That's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, this, but that guy and I still have a great relationship today. I still yeah. keep up with him. It took yeah. him and his wife to the Clemson game with us last year, the football game. Yeah. They awesome. live in Greenville. I called him up and said, why don't you your wife join my wife and I at the game? Nice. And it was, you know, so it, was, it didn't uh, yeah, you know, damage our relationship a long yeah. time, but at the time I still look back, you know, why? You know, yeah, you guys will do the same thing as your parents and stuff. You look back sometimes, where your parents say, "Damn, what?" Oh yeah. But, but you know, that certain <laughs> age, yeah. emotions, a lot of factors that go into why you acted the way you did at the time. But uh, but overall, I felt you know I was I was very in tune that that was important to me that I wanted my guys to you know feel like they had a good have a relationship with me, could talk about anything, either basketball issues, girlfriend issues, yeah. academic issues, whatever it was, just getting through the game of life together, and then really bring them from as an eighteen year old. To a much more mature 22, 22 year old when they left us getting, in the program. Right in the real world. Yeah, yeah, so, but you know, you know about 100% on that. You, you, you play yeah. as hard as you can. And, uh, and I, I observe coaches uh, still to this day. When I go to practice, I watch, you know, just want to see how true it is, how, how his um, grandson do with the guy. Just, I, I watch that stuff and kind of tune to it. So, um, the, uh, there's successful leaders that are, are really hard on their players, um, you know, coaching and stuff, and they're uh, they're not approachable, and they're successful, and they produce, they get wins, and they get the team to play sharp and, and tough. And uh, there's other ones that are more of that players' coach that are really friendly with the, with the guys, and they, eh, it's okay, Bobby, don't worry about it, you know. Kind of thing. And they're still, they're successful, yeah. you know. It's just that I think that what comes back all the time. I've said this to. Every you know uh, age group I've ever worked with is you know if you're going to coach you got to be yourself mm -hmm. you know and uh, you got your personality you can't try to be I can't I couldn't try to be Bobby Knight during that era Thank you God. know because I'm Bobby Knight <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly but you know but it, but it worked for Bobby Knight yeah. and those guys that played for him most of them loved him because they knew what they expect every day they knew what his expectations were not demanding he was and they 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 knew he pushed them to be the best they could possibly be and have success. I just can't do that every day. You know, just not, you know, just not my personality. So you have to figure yourself out 
Um, I tell this because how, much, how many stories you want me to tell you? I can tell you a bunch of stories. Uh, so, uh, so I'm working as a counselor at a, at a basketball camp in Pennsylvania. I've been working at it for a few years and as a player. And now I've gotten the Love It job. And it was the summer before, as I graduated here, I was going to become a head coach. And this high school basketball coach out of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, named Lloyd Wolf, smoked cigarettes, and just a tough old curmudgeon guy. And we had a break between games. And we're sitting outside, just me and him. And I said, I'm going to ask him, hey, you know, Coach Wolf, what, what does it take to be a great coach? I'm, I think he's going to say, you know, play tough man-to-man defense, run a fast break. I'm, I'm waiting for that kind of answer. Yeah. Just takes a <laughs> – blows it out real slow. This is a delay of maybe 20, 30 seconds, which seemed like five minutes. And the only two words he said was, be yourself. Went back to another dragon of cigarette. Going to say another word. Pretty damn good advice. Tell me what high school did you go to? JAC, Carolina Christian School. In the Bronx. So, hey, you know Coach Vick? I mean, you, know, you know him? Yeah. Oh, man. So, we get to, that's another conversation <laughs> we got, right? As you tell me the whole journey, I come back, hey, do you know Coach Vick? Oh, man, Coach Martin. Oh, Coach Martin and I have been boys, man. We've been boys like golf together. Do you know Coach Martin? Yeah, very well. I said. <laughs> this is what, you know, this yeah, I played basketball. Did you? Oh, yeah. what, what did you play? I played, I played the two guard. I played the two guard in two years. State champs? State champs. The 2010, 2011. You played the guy in Virginia? Malcolm Brogdon. Yeah. yeah. That crowd. And, uh, who, who's your, uh, you know, the wing scorer over there? Uh, Paul Dawson, AJ Davis. Yeah, how about that? Yeah, so this much more maybe the great, to me, one of the top three or four basketball coaches ever in the state. Oh, yeah. yeah. Flat Easily. out coach. Yeah, he's awesome. So just what so I would do this for this reason. So I do the conversation like you're saying, hey, you tell me, yeah, I know it. You know him, yeah, but we start talking, we get feel more comfortable, start liking each other, but that, that's stuff I can go back on, you know, just to know that I'm, I, and you're sitting here saying, this guy maybe picked up on my, you know, where I went to high school, he knows somebody I know, and, you know, it's, 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 I can trust him already. Um, and once you start explaining to him, hey, how their money dollars will impact the coaches or a student athlete, you know, life, that, the quality of life that we have, and most of them want to help. They want to you know, give back some way, shape, or form. So, but being a good listener is critical to hear what they're saying. And, and I, I had a, a guy last year. Um, the more I spoke with him, I realized, you know what? He doesn't want to get the athletics. He wants to get into the defaced uh, student aid here. That's what that's what got him through Georgia. Wow. So I, I, yeah. I said, Scott, why don't you give twenty five grand to the defaced scholarship program? He lit up like a fire. He lit, he lit, that's awesome. I can do that. You just definitely can do that. So I think it didn't help athletics. Yeah. It didn't help the school. It was helping yeah. some students. It was the right thing to do. I listened to yeah. what he was, you know, talking about. He wasn't interested in Foley Field remodel. <laughs> just but he, he what helped him get through Georgia was a need based scholarship. It was a way to pay it back. So put me in good favor with the university. That everybody on the campus thinks that's great, Sloniker. <laughs> he wasn't he wasn't being selfish. He wasn't trying to get all the athletics. He closed the gift for the university, not more than athletics. So that's, that's good stuff. Those are good days when those things happen. Yeah, that's, that's a great source. It seems, yeah. it seems like you're an expert just on like connecting with people. That, that's you know, that's what I'm doing all my life, really. That's, yeah. what, that's why I feel like I make the transition into development work from uh, coaching. Because that, that. Alcohol at the games, do you think that's a bad idea on the culture, or do you think that that could be actually a good idea? Great question. Um, and very topical, right right on the mix. I mean, you're right on the pulse of what's going on. So uh, several schools in the country have opted to sell alcohol in their stadiums, and they are profiting handsomely off it. West Virginia put out a couple months ago, they made $700,000 on their alcohol sales. So, uh, so you got things you have to look at. We're in the deep south. Um, we've got a uh, culture. Some people are absolutely adamant against alcohol being in the – Complex. We're, you guys know where alcohol is in Sanford Stadium right now? Are you aware where it is? Sweet. You would know. Yeah. Sweet. <laughs> so they have to stock it themselves. Okay, so they stock it themselves. So the Board of Regents have to approve any alcohol sale or more space dedicated to alcohol being in that space in, in our stadium. Um, Georgia Tech last year got approval in one area to sell alcohol. Beer and wine, but they, you get um, two or three uh, slips. You know, you get a you get a wristband, and you get two or three coupons to turn in for it. Um, could we? So our our thing, you want to start slow. Dr. Adams last year, we approached him about alcohol 
expanding out into other areas in our stadium, not selling it. Can we put liquor lockers, which a lot of schools have. Mm -hmm. They'd have a locker, you know, maybe a little bigger than a refrigerator. They could come in, put their bourbon, their whiskey, beer, wine into it, and then during the game they could access it, go back to their seats, access it. So probably the model for that would be your club levels. Yeah. Because it's stadium. I made a proposal. Uh, the old gate six area of the stadium, mm -hmm. the east end, mm -hmm. there's a, on a club level up there, there's this big wide space up there, it just sits there. I mean, it's big. I mean, I'm like, let's make up a damn yeah. Budweiser yeah. beer garden. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, but, so here's my thought, is, I already projected that we can make almost a half million dollars a year on here. Maybe not quite that much, but I think it was 400000 maybe last time I looked at it. But um, if we enclose that, climate controlled it, Sell it to Budweiser. Let them, let Budweiser, Miller, Coors, all of them just bid on it. And one of them get, win the bid, pay us, you know, to have the space, and then give us a percentage of the sales, where that's going to be. And that way, it takes us out of the mix. They, they control it. They know how to, you know, bartenders, they got professionals. They can do all that. I don't know if we're there yet. As a university, if I, they, they shot me down on it. Okay, <laughs> so, I like it. Uh, I love it because again, I, I, I have a controlled environment in the club level. Yeah. Right now, you can't access the club level unless you get a club level to mm -hmm. get pass. So we have control yeah. of, an, of a thing. It's not, now, not everybody. Not for the whole stadium. Now, West Virginia sells throughout their whole stadium. You got to be twenty-one students can go buy it. You know, we have the dome it's sold there throughout the stadium. Got to be twenty-one to buy it. Um, I don't see us getting there. In my lifetime, maybe if it's in my lifetime, it's going to be late in my lifetime. Because <laughs> just because we're in the deep south, just a different culture. It'd be a lot of people wouldn't want it throughout the stadium. But I do predict that in the next few years that either President Moorhead will say, I think, he, I think he'll lean the liquor locker. You know, my peers that I've gotten to know the last few years in the SEC, I think they're all um, genuine. They, they, mm -hmm. they're, they're tasked with you know, raising money for the athletic department and association, and they know that the, when that money comes in, it's going to improve the quality of life of coaches and student athletes. I keep saying it because that's the truth. And mm -hmm. but I think, yeah, I think everybody's uh, genuine about it. I think, um, you know, like Nick Saban goes into Alabama and, and he sizes up the whole athletic program. He says, all right, if, if we're going to go back to being, you know, a top five football program or the best football program in the country, here's what we got to do. you got to have more seats for the amenities in the stadium. That'll, that'll grow revenue. I, I think um, the cost of attendance, that difference between scholarship costs, room, books, and tuition, there's that difference. Um, where the uh, registrar's office says the difference is, I think that's what we should get the student athlete for living expenses. Here, I can go on for I got a lot of stuff. <laughs> so, but here, here's in a nutshell. All right, so who needs money? Like who should get paid? Do our golfers need to get paid? Most of them are from middle, um, upper middle class or upper class families. They might not need to spend the money. Now, they probably said they do. Hell yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. I give it to you, you yeah. give it to me. Yeah. Um, uh, do gymnasts, all that stuff. So, really, in my opinion, Mark Salonger's opinion is my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> who needs extra money is our kids who come from the lower socioeconomic families. So no matter what color skin they have, they're from a lower socioeconomic group, they should get some extra money. Well, what's in the system now is the Pell Grant. Mm -hmm. And Pell Grant's like $5,600 a year, I think. Depends on your... Right, so yeah, so let's just say it's, it's the max. So $2,800 a semester, and a semester is three and a half months. Yeah. So you break that down to uh, it's 100 days or so. So they're looking at 20, 30 bucks a day in cash, and all to be paid back if they use that money wisely. They don't go out and spend it like that. So they should have spending money, you know, just on the Pell Grant alone from the lower. So the group that I think needs money to get through college, they have the Pell Grant already. Now, if you added the cost of attendance to scholarship costs. I remember my youngest son went to Boston College and they said, you know, this is what it's going to cost you per year and you better pony up about another $4,000 in Boston was 
coat, winter coats, and <laughs> galoshes, and, yeah. and, and living in the city, and everything's, you know, coffee there costs six bucks instead of three bucks here, you know, it's great. all that, this way you should prepare to have that extra money. So my, my viewpoint, then, if, if that, if our student athletes that need the money get the Pell, get their Pell Grant, and we supplement it with the cost of attendance, which I think the Power Five conferences are going to vote in, the next question is, how are we going to regulate that? Because the cost of attendance at Southern Cal is a lot different than at Mississippi State, you know, <laughs> above and beyond. So will we regulate it? Will we just say, okay, everybody, you can get $2,500 for student athletes who are on full scholarship above the cost. So everybody's the same, so there's no recruiting advantage to anybody. Saying, hey, you know, Athens, we can give you 4000 more a year. Tuscaloosa, they only get 3000 That's a recruiting advantage on a kid from Atlanta. He said, well, I'll get four grand at Georgia. I'll get three grand at Alabama. I'll go to Georgia. You know, plus the Pell Grant. So that's kind of. So I think we should. I, I, I love the college amateur model. It's not a true amateur, but I know. I, I know that. I mean, I'm, I'm not silly. <laughs> but I like. I like that we're not pros. You know, we're not them. We're college. There are different ways we go about doing things, and the scholarship is important, and the education we're receiving is important. That education should take you through the next, you know, 50, 60 years of your life. If you do it right, pay attention, get a valuable degree. It should carry you through a lifetime of earnings and family, everything that, that goes with it. <clears throat> so I'm opposed to just flat out paying the players, but then, then who are you paying? What groups get paid? It's only football and basketball. Well, you're leaving of other people short. So if we could do something where the cost of attendance and the student athletes who do get Pell Grant, they should have, to me, ample money to get through the year, school year. They should never feel like they're hungry. straight out and put them back in career services, student services for our student athletes. No questions asked, just going right to them. We're going to put it in a pot, let it grow interest, and then use it. Hey, you come to me, and you're a student athlete, and you want to say, I want to study in Costa Rica, study abroad this summer. We're paying for it. We got it. We put it in that account. It's yours. You want to go to Europe, Australia, study abroad? You want to, you know, you need a professional career counselor on how to do your resume and all that? Sit we got that money sitting right there for you. Again, I think schools are smart. I'm fortunate we got a great AD who thinks those things. He wanted to, yeah, any extra money we're starting to get, he wants to reinvest in our student athletes. You know, put it back into them. So uh -huh. that's the tra career the track that we're on right now. Really. We just went through a, a year and a half long process on um, whether to raise ticket prices or not. In every single meeting, every single one, all of us, all the senior staff. We are never, while we're here, we'll never raise the student ticket prices. Not Ain't happening. Not negotiable. negotiable. So let's talk about other areas. So we don't <laughs> want to pass it. Well, why? That's, you know, ethically, morally, that's not right. We're taking, yeah. you know, we, the system was set up, we're getting that money, but, you know, let's use it different ways. Let's, you know, let's not gouge our um, students that have come in, want to come to the game and support it. You guys may have read the article earlier in the year about the Michigan, the new, the guy from uh, Domino's Pizza became the CEO of Domino's Pizza, they named him AD. Yeah. He raised student ticket prices of forty dollars a game. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that's right. So yeah. it's, it's got out of here. What are you thinking? Well, who's gonna go? How many how many free pizza? Who's gonna hold you up for two hundred and eighty three hundred bucks a year? Yeah. You know, so stupid. I mean just this there's a will that's but again this is stuff that we sit around and we think about and talk about. Yeah, you know, we don't want to shaft anybody. We have one of the lowest season ticket per game prices in the SEC. Johnny, Johnny Manziel would have been held out that all those allegations had come out before the first game. Mm -hmm. that, that short of time, mm -hmm. or in the middle of the season, he would have been held out too. That's that's the policy. That's what you yeah. do. They found out in the summer, so they could like they had time to that's your vet right. So this had happened if, again. All this was alleged, alleged to have happened last spring. This memorial memorabilia dealer had come to us, and um, uh, she didn't drop charges. Right, but he just was. Uh, they didn't proceed anymore because they had enough proof they said, I think, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So then we probably would have reinstated them too because it was a um, uh, letter of the law, you know, hadn't been charged with a felony, and we probably would have reinstated them too. Yeah. Crab legs, you probably would have been, I don't think we would spend them too. Yeah. Dual sport guys, so baseball suspended them because of the timing yeah. on football. So it's, uh, it doesn't look good. I think Florida State is not looking good. They had a reputation for that. I know it. I think every situation is unique. You're, you're going to have rules and policies and procedures. 
uh, at your institute, your, every school's different. Alabama's got different rules than we have, um, and even as a student, you know, that, with our, their councils, committees, and stuff that we have. So, I think in each situation is, is going to be unique and to the to itself and to where where you are, what school you're at, and then they're going to follow that policy. That that situation, uh, I'm sure, with the tight end from Alabama with all that drugs, mm -hmm. is probably a yet. He's probably hasn't been arrested yet, or charged yet. I don't know what. You know, that's a legal mm -hmm. thing of what decisions Nick Saban, they should have policy in place that if somebody's accused of a felony, then they're withdrawn from all activities until it's resolved. Either tr charges are dropped or um, exonerated, whatever it is. Yeah. So every place is different. It's just um, a different model, a different way we do things, and we, have, we, we enforce it. You know, we don't look the other way. We don't. So is it fair? It's fair to us because this is our policy. You know, when you sign on to come to Georgia and play at Georgia, you know that's what it's going to be. And you got to abide by it. And if you don't, you're going to suffer the consequences. Here they know it's the way it's going to be. They know they can, well, I'll smoke dope tonight. I'm going to get another run stadium steps. Yeah. Or just, you're missing 10% of your games, you know, whatever it is. So I think when you sign on, wherever you are, you know what those those rules are. You want to play at Georgia bad enough to be a dog, run right between the edges, and if everything is great about being a Georgia Bulldog, then you know what comes with it. You sign on for it. You know, you got to abide by it. Is it fair? Probably not, especially when one of your own gets 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 it. But I'm telling you, any any Todd Gurley situation, and I don't, unfortunately, I don't know the details. I don't want to know them. What you have to do is you you've got to get your leadership um, in that department. So you're the head of the department, uh, the professors, and that, say this is you know look at it and then develop a code and put it in place and let every student that's coming through in the sport management program read it, know it, and uh, abide by it. So I think it's just critical that you, you, you know, one thing we're, we're good at in higher education is being forming a committee and yeah. <laughs> we're the idea, right? We, we're going to committee the hell out of things you know, in higher education. So I think it's the way to go. you got to get smart people in a room and, and then put something down on paper and say, is that what we're going to live by? Is what we're going to work with? Be observant of what's going out there in the world uh, and other leaders in the, in, in the industry and see how they handle situations. Um, and then, so from an ethics standpoint, is that, hey, you know, I, I, that, that guy handled it, or that woman handled it right, that situation. We sometimes think, that just doesn't pass the smell. Why would they look the other way on that? Why didn't they discipline more, you know, wholeheartedly in that situation? So be observant. I advise you all of that. Be aware of your surroundings. Tell my own children. They, they can tell you, they watch it here right now. Dad says, be aware of your surroundings. That means downtown and late at night. That means, you know, in the world you live in, I used to make my assistant coaches read the newspaper. I had young assistant coaches, they're going to age, they don't, they didn't quit reading. I said, no, what's going on in the community? What's going on out there? No, there's a crime problem out the street, <laughs> down the street here. What are our students experiencing at night? Are they getting jumped and mugged? And, you know, what's happening? Well, just, you know, be aware of your surroundings. Know what's going on in the world. And so I just, what I encourage, you know, I talk to young people like yourselves, and, and along this model of an ethics thing is be aware. Know what's going on. You know, pay attention. You know, I'm current. I, I look at stuff every day. I stop three times a day to look at the AJC sports page and the front page. I look at the Athens paper front page, too, to see was there a shooting downtown or was there, did something happen at, uh, you know, a house explode somewhere. I, I just want to know. You know, it helps me current, be aware of what's going on, help conversations with people, uh, the, I'm dealing with that kind of thing, so, and then just see what you think, you know, you, you've been raised, each of you, okay, by parents, parent, whatever your, your background is, and they wanted you to behave and, and act accordingly in a certain way in life, they act a certain way accordingly in life, where they lead their lives, and then you, you see, you know, people make those decisions all the time, between right and wrong, and gray area, and be sketchy, you know, it may not be totally wrong, but it's a little sketchy. Yeah, maybe you could have handled it better. So just look at all those things, but, but know what's true to your heart, how you want to be perceived, and what you think is right, what you think is wrong. Times you may have to go in that gray area. Sometimes you may not. You know, you can keep it black and white on, a, on every decision. A lot of times you got to go in there because you're dealing with people all the time. We're dealing with people, and it's just not as clear cut as one or the other. And uh, so you got to make all those decisions. So what I tell you is be be observant. Know what's true to you, know how you were raised, know how you want to live your life. So as a group, 
we got the chance to go to Buttsmere and uh, meet with Mr. Slonikirk, who uh, does the booster uh, promotions for the Georgia Athletics. And we learned a lot of good things once we were there. We learned that he's a really sociable person. He can really like reach out to anyone and connect with them. And which sometimes people don't think that's a big thing, but it's actually a really huge thing, especially in the line of work where he's just trying to gain revenue for the athletic de department and he's trying to get new things for the athletic department and try to raise that revenue. So it's really good to know that he can connect with people and he can do that and it makes it re him really strong. And he also had a really good character and he was really social with all of us. He was joking with us. He had a lot of good things to say and it kind of he just kind of kept this conversation lively. It wasn't like a stale, boring conversation that most people think they would have with a professional in the sports industry or just professional in general. And what we learned, um, what we learned overall in the book is in chapter six about social responsibility. Uh, Dr. Um, Soniker showed that he really uh, knew about social responsibility. He had really true character. He, in all the ethical questions that he answered for us, he showed that he knew the true way to do it, the right way to do it, and he was honest. And you could see that he definitely had integrity within his job.